Van Gelderen is? Yeah. So I'm not going to go through the intro again, all right? Um, you didn't say anything about your books. That reminds me you're going to say something yeah. about them now. Yeah, I just and uh, I just uh, am thankful, for again, for the concentrated time that we can have together in God's Word. And it really is my desire that uh, someone that doesn't know Jesus might come to know him personally as their Savior during this uh, half week of meetings, and then those of us that do know him as Savior, that we might really learn to trust him, to walk with him. And that's really what uh, this summer Bible time is all about. So, Brother John, would you come? All right. Thank you. Genesis 35 in your Bibles at this time. Genesis 35. We'll mention a couple things there at the table. Uh, since I was with you last, there are a couple of new books. One of them is called The Liberating Life of Jesus. And the subtitle says, Finding Freedom in Christ Between the Two Extremes of Law and License. So while this is not the same message as this morning, it's the same message as this morning. <laughs> it's just coming at it from a different angle. Uh, but uh, what happens is we get on that outcome focus. Some focus on law. Some realize something's wrong there. And they focus on no law, which is still focusing on law in reverse. When the answer is found in a person, the liberating life of Jesus himself. And so this is going into that in tremendous detail uh, from a number of different angles. Uh, there uh, are several musical recordings that my wife has done over at the table here. And uh, one of them is called Christ Lives in Me. The song she just sang, You Are Always Good, is on this recording. And uh, that's a tremendous faith filter <laughs> reminder uh, that whatever God allows to come our way, he allowed. And the persecuted church has learned to put a faith filter on everything because they're in prayer all the time. It's the only way they survive. It's how we all should live <laughs> and uh, so on. But that song goes into that. But a lot of uh, um, revival truth on this, uh, obviously the uh, title song, uh, Galatians 2.20, Christ Living in Us. There's a song called Only Thee. It's written by Fanny Crosby. Most of us have not heard this song, unless you've got this recording already. <laughs> uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, puts the focus right on Jesus where it ought to be. Uh, the song called Trust Him, written by Lucy Bennett, uh, taken from one of the Keswick hymnals back in the early days when the convention was really uh, on target with the uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit and uh, so on. Tremendous words of faith. Some of the songs that my wife and I have put together, where I've written the words and my wife's written the music are on here. Like, I love you, Lord. Life again. The Wind of the Spirit, Knowing Christ, Help Me When the Lost, and so on are on this particular recording. This is vocal solo with full orchestration. Uh, there's another uh, solo recording Mary Lynn has done called The Presence of the Lord. Uh, this is uh, more of a meditative sound. It's not uh, all the bells and whistles of an orchestra. It's more of a uh, piano cello, piano flute kind of sound. And all of these are revival prayers, heart cries, like breathe on me breath of God. Oh, for a closer walk with God. You know, that yearning, uh, heart cries, starts with heart cries for personal revival, moves to heart cries for corporate revival. There is a song on that level that uh, your pastor made known to me. It's actually been in the hymnal for years. It's called God is Here. What a tremendous set of lyrics. And Joan Pinkston put that to music, and that is on here as well. And then there is one uh, piano recording. Uh, back in the 05 meeting, this probably had a red cover. So we changed the cover to make you think you don't have it. <laughs> so you can buy it again. <laughs> uh, this is all uh, piano arrangements of well-known hymns and gospel songs that uh, uh, hopefully you'll recognize the words since it's just a piano line. And uh, uh, think of the words, be blessed by the message as you hear the musical rendition. Uh, these are available individually or any three. There is a significant savings. Well, good to see you this afternoon. Amen. Genesis 35 in your Bibles. This morning, we talked about the importance of focus, and often we focus on outcome instead of person, and we don't get the outcome that we want, and so that's very, very important. We're going to uh, deal with some uh, details of the last part of that message tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we're going to peel back the layers of that, uh, uh, the truth of what God has provided when you got saved, but before we get there, there is a necessary truth, because sometimes... We do ignore everything. We do get off focus. And though we are not dirt balls at heart, but righteous, we make a dirty mess <laughs> because we ignore our provision. So then what do you do? 
Well, let's look at a beautiful picture here in Genesis chapter 35. Uh, this year, as I began my Bible reading, the Lord uh, leads in different ways each year for me. Uh, sometimes I'll hone in on a particular passage all year long. Uh, sometimes I'll read through the uh, scripture. I've been doing that. And so early on in January, got to the story of Jacob. And then this portion in chapter 35, and God arrested my attention. Genesis 35, verse 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee. In other words, to, to the God who appeared unto you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Go back to where I first appeared to you so that I can do it again. The title of this message is Fresh Encounter with God. Blessed Holy Spirit, once again, would you open the truth of this narrative to our hearts so that we see ourselves where we ought to and make the ap applications that we need to. Now, Lord, where we need a fresh encounter, bring us into that. Breathe on us, Lord. There may be one here who down deep really is in need. Lord, we all feel it from time to time. Lord, speak this truth afresh to our hearts. I plead the victory of Jesus through the shed blood over the enemy. Manifest that victory now. We thank you, Lord. We trust you to do it. Protect us, Lord. And speak to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My son is now 19. Last summer, uh, before he went to his first year of college, he went to two camps. He's always enjoyed camps over the years. And so he got to go to uh, one in June with a church that uh, he's gotten to know over in Iowa. And uh, he's gotten to know a number of the uh, uh, young people in that youth group. And so a couple of times he's joined them. Uh, for camp. And then our own church was going to a camp a month later in July. And perhaps the first camp prepared his heart for the second one. He told me later that as he was headed to the second camp, that he prayed and said, God, I don't want this to just be going through the motions. I need you to speak to me. God always hears that cry. Always. During that week, they had a service that apparently was on a different level than any of the other services. In fact, when our young people concluded that week, they said to the youth leader that on that night, God was in the room. Now, our young people don't talk that way, <laughs> which means... God was in the room. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we all know that God is omnipresent. But there is a difference between God's omnipresence and his manifest presence. God is everywhere present. He is very, everywhere present right here in Brooklyn, New York City. But you know there are thousands, multiplied thousands of people at this very moment are not conscious of God. God is not in their thoughts at all. But if God were to manifest his presence, the Bible wording for that is pour out his spirit, which is defined in Ezekiel 39 as God manifesting his presence. If God were to manifest his presence in the vicinity that we call Brooklyn, every human being saved or lost would become aware, conscious of the presence of God. That can happen in greater and lesser degrees of intensity, breadth of geography, and length of time. But when it happens, everyone's aware of God, even teenagers. And on this particular night, the preacher was preaching on purity. And he was, he was, cutting, he was cutting the word of God very sharply and in a very needed way. And I'm going to tell you, from what I can tell, God was manifest in that room that night. A couple of days later, my son called me at the end of the camp on Friday. He said, Daddy, he goes, I don't know, but he said, I, I think I'm in a revival. <laughs> and he started describing to me what I'm trying to describe to you. And I thought, oh, praise the Lord. 
he has been touched by the presence of God. And I'm telling you, he was, uh, he was lit up. Now, friends, sometimes we need a fresh encounter. As we come into this meeting, maybe you've already prayed like my son did. If not, you can pray now. God, may this be more than just going through the motions. We need to meet with you. We need you to touch down right here in Sheepshead Bay. We need to know that God is in the room. And we need that personally and obviously corporately. Now, in our passage, we have a narrative, a true account of something that actually happened in the life of Jacob. And the Old Testament narratives illustrate what is taught in a didactic fashion in the New Testament. You remember Jacob's story. Of course, his grandfather was Abraham, the friend of God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then there's Isaac, another man of faith. And then there's Jacob. And it seems like uh, maybe he was on a, a little lesser level <laughs> when he started out uh, when it comes to this whole matter of faith. And uh, his mother knew that uh, from the Lord that uh, the, his twin brother Esau, who was born first, uh, that somehow God had said the, the older will serve the younger. And she got manipulative about that. And uh, you remember that uh, he, uh, he, uh, Esau sold his birthright, but then later Jacob stole the blessing. Well, Esau got ticked, so much so that word had it that he was going to kill Jacob as soon as Isaac died. So Rebecca warned Jacob about that and sent Jacob back to her people uh, to find a wife there. And so he goes. And you remember he stops at a place called Luz. And that night he has a dream. And the angels of God are ascending and descending on a staircase into heaven, as it were. And he is moved by that dream. And he takes that rock and sets it up as a pillar to memorialize that place. And this verse that is behind me, uh, very uh, descriptive of your church name here, is, is his renaming of that place, Bethel. House of God. See, he met with God. God appeared to him. This is what's being referred to here chapters later in chapter 35. This is where it started. And God gave him some promises. And so Jacob made a few deals with God. He was still on the, the you know, wheel and deal level. <laughs> uh, just where he was, you know. God, God meets us where we're at. Man, praise the Lord. If we had to be mature for God to meet with us, we'd never, we'd never mature. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, uh, thankfully, God takes us where we are and brings us along. And that's where Jacob was. And, and so Jacob goes. And, of course, he meets Rachel. And, you know, 20 years later, he's got a big family. <laughs> and now he's got flocks and herds and servants and all sorts of things and uh, so on. And so he leaves Laban. That doesn't go too well, but he leaves. And then he's headed back uh, to where he came from. And he gets word that Esau is coming with 400 men armed. Well, that didn't sound good. So now he's petrified. And so uh, uh, that's that night where the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. And that's where God changed his name to Israel and all that took place there. Tremendous uh, time of meeting with the Lord uh, in an unusual and in a, in a difficult way, perhaps we might say. Uh, but then he goes and things go well with Esau. But instead of going back to Isaac, he goes to Shechem. And that doesn't go well because uh, the prince of the land, Shechem, uh, defiles uh, Jacob's daughter, Dinah. And the brothers are furious, rightly so. Uh, but instead of dealing with the one man, they killed every male in the whole city. That's called murder. And so now Jacob realizes, man, the whole place is going to be after us. We've made ourselves odious. My point is, he's way off course. And that's when we come to our text. <laughs> this, is, this is where he's at. He's way off course. And God said unto Jacob, arise. Go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God who appeared to you when you fled years ago from the face of Esau, your brother. God knew that Jacob needed a fresh encounter with God. 
Are you in need of a fresh encounter with God? How does this work? Well, as we read on in the narrative, we can see three phases to this encounter. It begins with a call to revival. This is that divine initiation I spoke to the men about yesterday morning, where God steps in and stirs, and God here speaks, and God said to Jacob, God spoke to this man. By the way, he speaks to you too. There are times when you know God's talking to you. Sometimes it's just the word of God and the spirit of God taking that truth and just speaking. may not be audible voice, but it's like it is. And you know God's speaking to you. Sometimes there's a circumstance and that spirit of God will say to you, I'm getting a hold of your attention. I'm saying something to you. Listen to me. But my point is God speaks and God spoke to Jacob here. See, there's this call to revival. God says, arise, go up to Bethel. Because geographically it was up, even though it was south of where he was at. Go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God who appeared to you. And so on. God who appeared to you. Arise, go back to that place where I first met with you, where I first appeared to you. Okay, so here's the Old Testament narrative. What's the New Testament truth? God's saying, remember when I first became real to you. Remember that. Remember your response. Remember what it was like. Remember what happened and all the blessing that came with it. Now, for those who get saved as adults, often that first memory will be their salvation. Uh, for those who perhaps have been out in the world and been in sin and, and all so forth, so forth, and then God convicts them and they come to Christ, often that's what they're going to think of. For those of us who get saved as little kids, you know, I don't remember a whole lot of what happened when I got saved at six. I remember that I got saved. And I didn't get saved at six. God, you know, simple childlike faith. That is what it is. You trust in Jesus, he saves you. But um, I don't remember much more. So for me, when I read a passage like this, it's a time of revival in my life. And the first time God became real on this level to me was in 1992 and 1993. It was actually a period of months that led to a point in 1993, I was reading the two-volume biography of Hudson Taylor, and I was studying Galatians and Ephesians in an inductive study Bible, and the word grace was all over those pages, and I began to notice that grace was, was not just undeserved favor, it is that, but that the favor was spirit enablement, and that it's not just for justification, it's for sanctification. That there is a divine ability through the Holy Spirit to lead and empower you to experience God this side of heaven. And I'm going to tell you, that was a great awakening. And uh, the Lord Jesus became real to me in a way that I had never known before. At this point, I was about uh, 30 years old. I just entered full-time evangelism. And uh, I remember when the truth came alive to me, I was in a little tiny building about the, this one section here. That was, it was even that's bigger than this little building. It was just six rows back and uh, just a few rows on this side, a few seats on this side. And the church had just suffered a split. And this is a town of 400 people. Can you imagine that? 400 people. That's all. <laughs> that's the whole town. And uh, uh, they just had a, a church split because they put in new carpet and half the people didn't like the color. It's the truth. That was a pretty bright bubblegum pink, but <laughs> not a reason to leave a church over. But I was sitting there in that building. My wife was practicing the piano, and the truth came alive to me of the futility of the flesh and the necessity of the spirit of Jesus and the futility of flesh dependence and the necessity of God dependence. And, and that is when Jesus became real to me. And it, it, was a, it was a reviving time. In fact, for the next three weeks, I couldn't talk about Jesus without crying. Now, I'm one of those guys that it's very hard to shed tears. When everybody else is crying, I'm not crying. You know, it's just, I, I was, I, you know, some of us are weird. <laughs> uh, but I'm supposed to be crying. I'm just sitting there. But uh, I couldn't talk about Jesus without crying. In fact, I went back to my home church where I had grown up and had been on staff. And I had previously had a Sunday school class there. And the uh, new Sunday school teacher, now that I was an evangelist, and said, hey, why don't you teach the class this Sunday? And I tried to declare what God was doing for my soul. And I blubbered my way through 45 minutes. 
I have no idea if it made any sense at all. <laughs> I just That's just where it was. And that's what I think of when I read a passage like that. Go back to that room, that memory when I first appeared to you and, and became real to you. That happened again for me in 1999. Now that doesn't fit because people who think there's a second blessing, now this is a third blessing. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, it's all an access of the first blessing. And uh, wow, 1999, wow, that was an amazing time. And nearly everything I preach today came out of what happened from March to May in 1999. That's a whole other story. But those are the kinds of things that I think of. Now, for you, you got your own story. And your story is your story. And God says, look, go back to that place, that time. When I first appeared to you, for some of you, you're going to think of when you got saved. For others, you're going to think of when that reviving presence of Jesus hit you and all of a sudden you were uh, kickstarted into a walk with God that was on a whole different level. And God says, go back. Meet with me again. This time not to wrestle, Jacob. This time to commune. Because he says, make an altar. And that, of course, pictures the fresh surrender. It's the Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your bodies, that living sacrifice. There's the whole burnt offering. Absolute surrender. And so God is saying to Jacob, you need a fresh surrender. You ever needed one? Uh, he says, go back, build that altar. And then he says, dwell there. I want you to live there. I want you to stay on course. So here you have this divine initiation. God said, it's when God stirs you and you know you need a fresh meeting with God. But that brings you to phase two, the pursuit of God. When there's a divine initiation and God stirs you, God wants us to have a faith response. And what we see here is, is Jacob's faith response. I think we could actually rightly describe it as the pursuit of God. And there's two parts to it, which is interesting, because one part is what God said. The other part is what Jacob knew intuitively had to take place in order for him to do what God said. That's the first part of this. It's more of what we could call the preparation for revival. Notice, God says all this in verse 1. Go back to that place where I first appeared to you. What does Jacob do first? He says, then said Jacob unto his household, so his family, and to all that were with him, his whole entourage. He had servants, he had people, his family was huge anyway. And look what Jacob says. Put away the strange gods that are among you. And be clean and change your garments. Now, that isn't what, those words are not in verse 1. But Jacob knew, if he's going to go meet with God, there's some stuff in the way. For Jacob to say to his own family and to his workers, get rid of the idols, means he knew they had them. You remember his wife Rachel took some idols from her dad when they left. And apparently there were more, as we're going to see here, because they did deal with this. But put away the strange gods. Put away the foreign gods. Put away the idols. In the New Testament, that truth of putting away the foreign gods would picture the idea of getting rid of anything that is blocking the flow of God in your life. Now, friends, you sang a moment ago, not I, but Christ. When you got saved, he moved in. He's there. Why isn't he always manifest? Stuff gets in the way. The fountain is there, but the flow is sometimes blocked. And that's what we have to deal with here. Put away the strange gods. It could be a sin issue that's been pampered. Maybe a pampered grudge that turns into bitterness that defiles. Maybe a secret indulgence. You know, secret habits, habits of indulgence, none of that happens without you giving our, without any of us giving ourselves permission to do it. Before you ever get into the sin, you gave yourself permission to go there. But when you keep doing that, then you develop this blocking of the flow of God. Sometimes it's just selfish ambitions, ambitions that may not be wrong in and of themselves, but they're wrong because you know they're not God's will for you. And you just think, I, I've got to have this. When God is saying, no, 
this is what is best for you. Sometimes it's just the arrogance and pride and the condescension of others. But Jacob says here, put away the strange gods. Put away the foreign gods. Friend, what foreign god do you have in your life right now? What is it that you excuse? See, we're going to talk about all this provision for victory, but you can't have the idol and Jesus together. <laughs> the idols have to go. So how do we deal with it? For them, they buried these idols under a tree. For us, we confess them. <laughs> we walk in the light, the light of God and his truth that shines and says, hey, that's, that's dirt. You're not dirt. You're righteous. But you're acting dirty. <laughs> you got in the mud over here. Okay, get honest about it. And so when we confess our sins, when we get honest, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. Friends, we got to get honest. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Neighborhood Bible Time training. Uh, this is a, a, a group that's been around for, for years now, maybe 40 years. I don't know. Uh, uh, young people, young men from Christian colleges uh, are in this. Uh, they come to this training time and then they go out and hold Bible schools and so forth and youth meetings throughout the summer. And uh, for the last 15 years, I've had the privilege of going to their training time. And I just am there for two days. Uh, before, before I get there, there's usually two other preachers. Uh, they bring in evangelist John Getch to preach the sin out of them. <laughs> and I'm telling you, <laughs> every year, man, they are coughing it up. <laughs> every sin you can imagine for a bunch of guys from college, they're, it's getting dealt with. And on the week that we just had, the next preacher, and I caught his last message. I was to preach the next day. He was dealing with the cleansing that happens when you get honest, which we're going to come to in a second. And you know what? It was so neat. Larry Koontz, he's the director. He said, all right, guys, tell us what God's doing in your heart. So this testimony meeting started. And it was good. And then it got really good. You know what I'm saying? It's when somebody gets more than just the surface on us to the real on us. And Larry knew God was working. And I've seen this happen almost every year. Sometimes it happens before I get there. Sometimes I get to see it. He said, all right, guys, take a knee. That means we're going to have a prayer meeting. That was a cement floor. <laughs> Some of those guys were on their knees for the next two hours. Some of us sat up and said, I got on a chair because my knees can't take it. But I'm going to tell you, God was in the room. And you know what? They had dealt with their sin. And when they got clean, I'm going to tell you, the presence of God was so felt. Can I use that word? I remember one kid. I've never met him in my life. He goes, oh, God, I've never been in a prayer meeting like this. God, I don't want this to stop. This is like an hour and a half into it. I remember taking a picture. I got it on my phone. All these bodies, head and toe, flat on the cement floor. Meeting with God. You see, they had come clean. And friends, God says, put away the strange gods. But then it says, and be clean. Now, I love this. This is an interesting word. When you look up the stem that's used here, uh, it can be either the idea of purifying yourselves or present yourselves for purification. Now, we can't purify ourselves. <laughs> So it's got to be the second nuance, and that is how it's translated here. Be clean. In other words, you get honest, and God does the cleaning. And that's what's so beautiful about 1 John 1. When you walk in the light, when you confess your sins, when you get honest, when you agree with God, when you call sin what God calls it without making excuses, without blaming it on the environment, without blaming it on the uh, other person, but you just get honest and say, God, the other person, the environment, whatever that is, whatever part they had, it only exposed what I'm capable of. And when you get that kind of honest, then the blood of Jesus comes rushing in like a tsunami and cleans you all up. You're clean. That's not salvation. It's cleansing. It's restoration back to fellowship. You're clean. God brought this home to my heart in 2001. So I told you 99 uh, was a key moment. That uh, 93 was awakening to God's power. 99 was awakening to God's person. Uh, the key to that focus thing that we're dealing with. Uh, but I still, you know, all have much to learn. And uh, so another truth that God taught me in 2001 was the clean heart. I was over in Belfast, Ireland, Northern Ireland. We actually in Southern Ireland, we went up north to go to this particular bookstore. 
And I'm at this bookstore and I said, Lord, is there something I'm supposed to get? And I was drawn to a book called The Spirit of Revival. It's the biography of John George Govan, who later founded the faith mission that God used to train Duncan Campbell, uh, who was used of God in many revivals. Well, the truth of Govan's life is the clean heart. You know what? I was a preacher's kid. I knew what it was to confess my sins, especially when you have the wrong focus and you're just looking at the law. And so it's showing you all the things you're doing wrong. So I, so I had the wrong focus and I, I had confession down. <laughs> confess, confess, confess. But I would confess and walk away feeling guilty. When God says, look, when you get honest, he is faithful and just to release you, forgive, and to cleanse you Clean you up from all unrighteousness, which means when you and I get honest, that blood cleans us, which means we need to take by faith the clean heart. And what Govan said is what changed my life. He walked away after he had applied that truth and said, I have a clean heart. I have trusted the Lord Jesus for it, and he has done it, even though I don't feel it, because it's by faith, folks. And when you take it by faith, God will give you the feelings when you need them. <laughs> uh, but the fact is, you've got to know down deep because feelings come and go. You need deeper than feelings. You need the knowing that you are clean. And when you take that clean heart, what a radical difference that makes. And then he says here at the end of verse 2, and change your garments. So there's confession, there's cleansing, and now there's clothing. <laughs> uh, put on Jesus would be the New Testament parallel. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Take by faith the fact that he is your clothing. And put on him, Romans 13, 14. So that's what he tells them to do. None of that was in verse 1, but that's what he tells them. And then he says in verse uh, 3, after telling that in verse 2, Arise, let us go up to Bethel, and I'll make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods. They responded which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. Apparently, those were earrings that were a part of the pagan worship. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them. Remember, they were afraid that the, everybody was going to come after them because they killed everybody in Shechem. And, but God protected them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar. So now he does it. Now we get to what God told him to do. And so now we have moving from the preparation to the actual presentation, he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. I love this. God told him, go back to where I first appeared to you, Bethel, house of God, build there an altar, fresh surrender. So Jacob knows we got stuff in the way. They deal with the sin. They get cleansed. Uh, they put on Jesus, as it were, change their garments. Okay. And then they build that altar. And isn't it interesting what he says at this point? He says, El Bethel, God of the house of God. And now his focus is on God. See, in his earlier part of his journey, which is what happens to many of us, his focus is on all the blessings we can get from God. And now his focus switches to God himself, the blesser himself. You see, he pursued God. In 2003, I pulled into a church in Runnels, Iowa. It's out in the country east of Des Moines. I'd been there once on a Sunday morning. So I didn't really know the pastor very well yet. I'd only been there on a Sunday morning, but he had booked me for a meeting. So it was August. We pulled in. And uh, I'd set up my trailer, and I'd gone behind the church, and I was just out talking to the Lord. <laughs> the pastor had figured out I was back there, and he came around the corner, and he starts telling me something. And I don't hardly know him yet. I don't know the church. He says, now, he said, there's about 15 people in the church here that have a burning heart. He didn't say heartburn. <laughs> he said, 15 people have a burning heart. Now, he didn't tell me what that meant. He just said, no, it's not the whole church. He said, but uh, there's, there's about 15 people here that have a burning heart. He said, Morris Gleister was the last evangelist, and he said he could tell that something was going on with a few of the people, and he said, uh, I just wanted you to know that. Well, I have no idea what that means when he tells me that. I found out later 
Now, that church had gone through an incredible crisis. I won't take time to detail it, but they had lost half the church. They had lost the majority of the youth group. The youth pastor, which is the pastor's son, was uh, writing this curriculum for the special youth thing, and they were going to demonstrate it with their kids, and now the kids aren't there. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 it was a mess. The youth pastor, the pastor's son, said he was throwing away books from his library. What's the use? This is called low discouragement. And he came across The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And God said, you need to read that one. And he began to read it, and God lit a fire. And he began to pursue God. He passed the book to his dad, the pastor. The fire spread. They passed it to a few more. That's the 15 people with the burning heart. And months prior to this meeting, unbeknownst to me, they had started a Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, fellowship of the burning heart and those 15 people had been crying out to God and saying God we're desperate if you don't step in this is over so I don't know that part of the story yet I just know there's 15 people with a burning heart by the end of Sunday I could see their faces I could see the fire I could see the passion I could see the glow of those hungry hearts after the service they were pummeling me I mean just like Pummeling me with questions about revival. It was it was amazing. I thought, what in the world? Something's going on here. Monday night, the same way. I mean, God was on the move. On Wednesday night, that assistant pastor comes to me and he says to me, This is before the service. I don't know him hardly. He's kind of a quiet guy, unusual for a youth pastor. <laughs> he said, God is going to do something very special tonight and he turned around and walked away oh, wow that night in the providence of God I preached a message on the Holy Spirit and God led us to have an after meeting that's just a meeting after the meeting we've said had some here from time to time over the years and I'm gonna tell you in that after meeting God came and again and again there's nothing weird about this this is just man's response to the presence of God. But when the presence of God becomes that really, you just get down. I remember peaking. I'm sure you've never peaked in prayer, but I do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm seeing these bodies just flat. And I mean, they are coming clean with God. And they're taking the clean heart. That was the biggie. And that went an hour and a half. Seemed like 10 minutes. Now, I've been in 10-minute prayer meetings. It seemed like an hour and a half, but uh, this was the other way around. Then it happened the next night. Then it happened the next night. Then on Saturday morning, I met with the Fellowship of the Burning Hearts. You know, and man, I'm going to tell you, do you know that God brought a genuine season of refreshing to that church? It went for months. I had to go on to the next meeting. <laughs> they just kept rolling and uh, testify to this day that it was a radical turning point in the life of the church. You see, the pursuit of God. So there's the call to revival, there's divine initiation, there's the pursuit of God, that's the faith response. And then finally, there is the encounter with God. There's that divine touch, God moving, God bringing to pass what he started. And so what happened here? It says in verse 9, and God appeared. See, remember verse 1, go back to where I first appeared. Well, they did. They pursued God, and God appeared. Do you know it's not enough for you to hear about revival? you got to experience God yourself. A few months ago, we were in San Francisco, and we had the opportunity to go to the San Francisco Symphony. I hadn't been to it for years. I'd been there, actually, before. I've been to the Chicago Symphony a number of times. But I haven't been to a symphony in years. And, you know, I can describe a symphony, but if you've never been there, the description doesn't even come close to being in that room when all those instruments are going and you're experiencing all that sound. It's powerful. And friends, you can hear about revival, whether it's a personal revival like a Jacob or a corporate revival like that church in Iowa. But it's not the same. To hear about it, it's not the same as you being, you being revived. See, what a difference.
And so it says in verse 9, and God appeared unto Jacob again, <laughs> again. See, God appeared. He's the life that we need. Life again. Revive. Re means again. Vive means life. Life again. God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. <laughs> and then, I love this. You know, it's it, this came in God's timing because I skipped over verse 8. Uh, it tells us that Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she was buried and so forth and so on. You know, they they applied what God said. They dealt with the sin issues. They built that altar. They sought God himself. And then God appeared in his perfect timing. God knows you can't manipulate God. But God appeared in his timing. And it says at the end of verse 9, and blessed him with his blessings. Then it gets really specific because verse 10 says, and God said unto him, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Now, wait a second. He was already called Israel when he wrestled with the angel back in chapter 32. But he, he got off course again. And so in this renewal, in this revival, God, I love this, renews the transformation that started when he had to touch his thigh. And that was the beginning of transformation for Jacob on a whole new level. But he got off course even after that. But when he gets back on course, God renews the transformation. <laughs> and friend, you may have experienced revival before, uh, but maybe you're off course and God can put you right back. So you're right back on course again. And that transformation continues. It's what God does. Revival restores that maturing process. It doesn't make you spiritually mature. It restores the maturing process so you can mature. And then verse 11, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and company of nations shall come out of thee, uh, shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Not only a renewed transformation of his own personal life, a renewed purpose, renewed destiny. Sometimes we just kind of give up. Oh. But when God meets with you and you're back in tune with God, all of a sudden there's a renewed purpose and destiny. In verse 12, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, that was big, uh, the covenant, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. There's the renewed promises. You get back on course. Let me tell you one more story. Last year, 2021, I think it was. Could have been 2020. I don't remember. Eh, it could have been 2020. That was COVID. I think it was 2021. So at any rate, I rolled into a church where I knew the pastor. I had known him since he was in junior high school. I had known his dad. And in fact, the first time I ever saw the outpouring of the Spirit was in his dad's church in 1993 in West Virginia. Oh, wow. At any rate, that's another story. So this is the son. And uh, he had gone to Bible college and called to preach. Uh, and uh, he had married uh, a lady and... Uh, uh, she had a very difficult background, uh, grew up in a witch's home and, and so forth. Um, and then he took this church. Well, things weren't going well, and the church dwindled down to about 15. Well, it's kind of hard to pay the bills when your church is only 15. But then God did a couple of things to turn things around. This young man went to a men's conference that was on target. And he dealt with the sin issue he had dealt with many times before, but he had never told anybody, which means it's easy to go back to it. you got to be wise about these things. But at any rate, I'm going to use his wording. He's very open about it. He's been open about it with his whole church. He went back and told his wife that he was a porn addict, but that God had dealt with him and that he was coming clean, and now he was even going to tell her. Well, it nearly destroyed her. And for three months, she would not even let him touch her. But after three months, she saw that he meant business, that he was staying the course. And she said, I can't do this to him. And God began to move in her heart. And she began to seek the Lord. And together, they got on a path of revival. I mean, on a, the real deal revival. Well, practically speaking, they had to pay their bills. So he started a coffee shop and sandwiches and stuff. And in the coffee shop, he was just he was just so thrilled that the sin had been buried. He's now months into victory and never experienced this before for years. And uh, so uh, he just he would just tell people about it to come into his shop. 
Now this is East Tennessee. You got believers, you got unbelievers, but there's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of you know people background and so on. And uh, he just starts telling the story and everybody's like, you know, big wide eyes. Everybody's hearing this story, you know, cause he's, he's open and honest about the sin issue. And the, well, everybody's got issues of some sort. And it started a revival in the, in the coffee shop. People started getting right with God. One guy came in from another church. He's a little country church out in the backwoods. And another guy comes in. He says, hey, my pastor and I, we got a podcast. <laughs> he said, of course, in his southern drawl, I can't quite do it. Uh, but uh, at any rate, he says, you need to be on our podcast. And he said, I'm sure my pastor will be okay about it. So they bring him into the podcast. Well, my pastor friend told me, he said, I didn't plan to tell the whole world on the podcast about my sin issue. But he said, it just came out. <laughs> he said, I just told my story and it just came out. And he said, uh, the pastor was there from this other church. It's part of the podcast. And he got mad about it because that was his sin issue too. And he dealt with it. Now the revival started going in the next church. So you got it in the coffee shop. You got it in that pastor's church. You got it in this other church. And by the time I rolled into town, a third church was being affected. And they were now meeting once a month around a campfire to talk about truth. And God was on the move. And I came in and I didn't know all this was going on yet. I come in and and he says, we've got a campfire tonight if you want to come. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, uh, maybe I will, I'll, you know, whatever. And then he says, oh, well, let me tell you the schedule tomorrow. He says, you speak at 8 o'clock in the morning at a men's prayer breakfast. He said, you speak at 11 at my church. He said, you speak at the podcast at the other church at 4, and you speak at that other church at 6. So I thought, well, maybe I'll skip the campfire because uh, oh, I didn't know I got all this coming. Then he started telling me the story, and I thought, I need to go to that campfire. And I'm going to tell you, friends, here's three different churches meeting with God. There was a lost man at that campfire. You might be here today and you're lost. You don't know Jesus. There was a lost man because he was from Texas and came to see one of uh, uh, his cousin who was in one of these churches that was experiencing this move of God. And uh, I, I noticed the kid. I didn't know he was lost. He was just in the group, but I noticed his face was stone cold while everybody else was red hot for Jesus. And at the end of that uh, fire time and talk time, the pastor stood up. He said, he goes, I sent somebody here doesn't know the Lord. He said, uh, we're going to pray. He said, you just nudge the person next to you and tell them, hey, I got to get saved. And so he prayed. Well, that kid didn't talk right then, but on the way home, when he got into the car with his cousin, he said, I'm the one. He said, I got to get saved. They were at church service the next morning. That kid that had the dark face, he was lit up with God. Jesus was all over that countenance. God on the move. Do you know by the time I walked in that meeting, that church had grown from 15 to 80. And I walked into a revival. Now, friends, God stirred that preacher. He responded. He put away the foreign gods. He made that fresh cement surrender. He put his eyes back on Jesus. That's where you find life. And they were experiencing a fresh encounter with God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Friend, if there are some idols that need to be put away, let's do it. Just where you're at. If you want to slip to your knees, you can. Or just where you're at in your chair. Let's talk to God.